Okay, and we're lost. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, what part of the world it is you uh, may be in. Uh, but welcome. Uh, I'm John Bowson, the Deputy Director of the Global Taiwan Institute. We are a 501c3 think tank located in Washington, D.C., focused on contemporary Taiwan issues and the U.S. Taiwan relations. And we uh, pursue this mission through a range of programs uh, that includes our important nightly publication. The Global Taiwan Group, which is available on our website, containing uh, analytical articles on Taiwan politics, defense issues, economics and trade, and social issues. Uh, we also do it through our podcast series, and Taiwan Salon and Taiwan Insights, as well as through periodic uh, public policy discussion seminars, such as the one we're, we're having today. Thank you so much for joining us. And this is a very uh, important topic. Uh, today, we're looking at the defense policy changes in, in the uh, Indo-Pacific region in response to rising tensions over Taiwan. Um, that's certainly uh, the rising tensions over Taiwan is certainly something that's gotten a great deal uh, of attention, and increased attention uh, over the course of the past year, most prominently in the uh, large scale and, and very provocative military exercises that were conducted by military forces of the People's Republic of China uh, in the immediate wake of a visit to Taiwan by uh, then um, U.S. Uh, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, uh, again, most provocatively with the uh, mit uh, missile launches that were fired uh, around and uh, in uh, some instances over uh, Taiwan itself, including some that landed in uh, Japan's um, exclusions. And uh, these uh, this increased uh, piracy military activity has prompted uh, defense policy changes um, in a number of ways. It has done so certainly in Taiwan itself, which over the past uh, year or a couple of years has seen some uh, very prominent policy changes that have taken place. Um, one of those being significantly increased defense spending. Uh, I believe for this past year, uh, the uh, defense budget the Taiwan's government passed was believe, about a 14% increase from the, from the year before. Uh, also, in late 2021, there was a very, uh, outside of the regular budget, there was a very large uh, supplemental that was passed to uh, fund the increased production of uh, domestic uh, anti-ship missiles and anti-aircraft missiles. But Taiwan has certainly ramped up its own defense spending. Uh, and then, uh, perhaps most prominently, and uh, most... Uh, politically uh, costly, if that's the right way to put it, at least one that involved greatest expenditure of political capital. Taiwan's government took the uh, dramatic step uh, at the end of this past year of announcing the uh, increase of conscripted service time, uh, which had been shortened uh, to four months for a young man. They announced a new plan where that was going to be expanded out to a, a year of required training uh, for young men in Taiwan, along with a broad framework plan as to uh, uh, how those you know, increased numbers of conscripted service soldiers uh, would be used. So, and within Taiwan itself, there's certainly been some fairly dramatic steps taken. Um, but I think uh, perhaps at least uh, in the United States anyway, uh, less attention has been paid to some of the uh, ways in which the more provocative, aggressive military behavior by the PRC has also been impacting other countries in the region and producing changes in, in those countries. Uh, most prominently, let's say in Japan and the Philippines, a couple of other countries that we're going to take a look at today in terms of late this past year with the Japanese government itself announcing uh, or laying out a new uh, national security strategy and plans for significantly increased defense spending, um, as well as uh, developments in the Philippines, which is recently uh, made a new agreement with the United States for the use of military bases in the Philippines and with some, uh, I would say anyway, surprisingly frank comments by uh, the new president of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos, expressing his concerns over potential uh, conflict over Taiwan and what it might mean for the Philippines. So uh, we're going to try to delve into some of those issues a little bit more today. And we're very fortunate to be joined by three uh, very distinguished speakers who are going to help us uh, delve into that. Uh, first, on my immediate left, I have Lieutenant General Wallace Chip Gregson, uh, the United States Marine Corps, retired. Uh, General Gregson served in a number of uh, prominent uh, national security positions throughout 
course of his career. I hope I get all these right. Um, you know, okay. uh, from 1998 to 2000, he was director of Asia Pacific Policy in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, from 2001 to 2003, he served as commanding general of the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force in Japan. Uh, from 2003 to 2005, he was commanding general of Marine Corps Forces Pacific and Marine Corps Forces Central in Command, in which he uh, exercised uh, command over 70,000 uh, U.S. Uh, Marine Corps and U.S. Navy personnel uh, in, in those two theaters. And following retirement you know, from 2009 to 2011, he also served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific uh, Security Affairs. And, uh, General Bryson is a uh, uh, graduate of the United States Naval Academy and also holds uh, master's degrees from the uh, Naval War College and Stalin and Jan College. So thank you for joining us today, General. I thank you. Uh, then, at the end of the table, we're also very fortunate to have with us today Dr. Naoko Aoki, who is an associate political scientist at the RAND Corporation. Uh, her previous academic work has uh, focused on East Asian security issues, uh, including uh, previous work on nuclear policy, nuclear security policy in, in Asia and the North Korean nuclear program. Uh, she has also served in previous positions as a non resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in a nuclear security fellowship with the uh, House of Representatives. And for, prior to her academic career, she was also a journalist uh, for a number of years with Japan's uh, Kyoto News. She holds a, um, uh, an MA in international relations from Johns Hopkins SAIS uh, and uh, a PhD from the University of Maryland. Uh, Dr. Nelke, again, thank you, Matt, for joining us today. Uh, and also, uh, a special note of thanks, I think, is due to Dr. Uh, Renato Cruz de Castro, who has very kindly uh, offered to uh, join us and to share his expertise with us at a, a very uncivilized hour uh, in the Philippines. He's uh, joining us uh, from Manila, where it's now after 10.30 p.m. So uh, we, we have really uh, abused his generosity in asking him to uh, join us today. We're, we're very fortunate that uh, he has done so. Uh, Dr. Uh, Castro is a distinguished professor in the International Studies Department of De La Salle University uh, in Manila, uh, and also where he holds the Dr. Aurelio Calderon Chair in Philippine American Relations. Uh, he has taught courses in a number of Filipino government uh, institutions over the years to include the National Defense College, uh, the General Staff College of the Philippines Armed Forces, and the Foreign Service, in, excuse me, the Foreign Service uh, Institute. Uh, he has also previously served as a consultant uh, to the National Security Advisor of the National Security Council during the uh, Aquino uh, administration, 2010 to, uh, to uh, 2016. Uh, he has published uh, widely in academic journals on international relations and, uh, and international uh, security issues. Uh, and he holds two master's degrees from the University of the Philippines, a PhD from the University of San Diego. So once again, a uh, special note of thanks to to uh, Dr. Castro uh, for, uh, for joining us uh, today. Um, as we get ready to go into our conversation, uh, I'm going to ask each of the panels to speak for a few minutes. Um, I think I will extend the uh, or present the floor first to Dr. De Castro again in light of the uh, late hour there. Um, uh, before our speakers begin, I would like to remind our audience, uh, both those who uh, have joined us here in person today, as well as those joining us online, that uh, you two are part of this conversation. Um, and after the presentations by our speakers, we're going to allow time for, uh, for Q&A. So we welcome your questions. Uh, if you are here uh, live with us today, uh, when that time comes, if you'd like to ask a question, just please raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. Please identify yourself and ask your question. Um, if you are one of those joining us online, uh, you can submit questions to us uh, two ways. One is through the uh, chat window on the YouTube, if you are watching it there. Uh, you can also email questions to uh, contact at globaltaiwan.org. And that's contact at globaltaiwan.org. So uh, we welcome your questions when the time comes for Q&A. Uh, I think with that said, without further ado, I will turn the floor to our speakers. And uh, Dr. DeCastro, are, uh, can you hear me, sir? Are, are you ready to begin? Yeah, I'm ready to begin. Okay, I will turn the uh, virtual floor over to you, sir. Uh, good morning there in Washington, D.C. 
you know, it's uh, looking forward probably joining you by the uh, early uh, summer when I will have my fellowship in the East West Center. So I'll start my presentation with an anecdote uh, regarding a webinar that happened about a year ago. Uh, it was organized by a Japanese think tank. And during the webinar, you know, we were talking about Taiwan. And during the webinar, an Australian academic raised the issue. Isn't there any U.S. ally near Taiwan? Because all the U.S. bases are, of course, located in Okinawa and in Guam. Then I reacted, yeah, you have the nearest treaty ally there that happened to be the Philippines. Everyone seems surprised that the Philippines is a treaty ally of the United States. Of course, this was understandable because it was during the period of Duterte. So let me start my presentation. First slide, please. First slide. Can you move the slide? Or do I do the uh, movement? We can see it on our end. Okay, can you, first slide, can you move it? Okay, of course, obviously the Philippines is the closest country to uh, Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan. Uh, it's very, uh, you know, the Philippines is in a way the border between Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. Next slide, please. So both countries are located at the either side of the Luzon Strait, which is, of course, a very important choke point. It is a choke point for, of course, where you can move from the north, uh, uh, the northern part of the South China Sea into the Western Pacific. You know, it is a very important area of operation during the Second World War, where, of course, you have U.S. Navy subs intercepting Japanese convoys that were, of course, taking supplies from Southeast Asia going to Japan. Next slide, please. Of course, the two countries are so close. You know, when I deliver a talk in the Armed Forces of the Philippines and I emphasize the importance of Taiwan, you know, at the onset of the Second World War in the Pacific, uh, just a few hours after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, you have, of course, the, uh, the, Imperial, uh, the bombers from the Japanese Imperial Army attacking MacArthur's bombers, B-17 at Clark Air Base, and practically destroying 50% of them, rendering, of course, American air power uh, significantly, of course, uh, 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 would call this destroyed just a few hours after Pearl Harbor. That's how close we are with, of course, Taiwan and vice versa. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So the first crisis, of course, uh, happened or, uh, for the Philippines. This was the first time that we really became aware of the, uh, the fact that we we're close to Taiwan. And I could still remember the USS uh, Kitty Hawk was docked in Manila Bay two weeks before the actual crisis. So uh, this was a time that the Philippines was also shocked by the presence of uh, Chinese forces that occupied Mischief Freak, just in February of 1996. So during this time, the Philippines was, you know, asking Washington, why did this happen? Then a month later, of course, you have a greater crisis that happened. And this was a time that the United States government, uh, in, you know, through the back doors, asked the Ramos administration if it could use some of the facilities that were, of course, evacuated by the U.S. Air Force, 13th Air Force. After the withdrawal of American forces from Clark and Subic Naval Base in 1992. Next slide, please. So at that time, of course, it's uh, uh, the United States the Clinton administration deployed two carrier battle groups. One of them came from uh, from Manila Bay. Next slide, please. So after the incident, of course, both sides decided to revitalize the alliance that was, of course, severely undermined by the withdrawal of American forces after, of course, the Philippine Senate did not concur to the Philippine-American Cooperation Treaty of 1991. So this was one of the important motivations behind the decision to negotiate for a visiting forces agreement. So the possibility that U.S. forces could have access to northern Luzon just in case you have a repeat of what happened in March 1996. Next slide, please. 
So eventually, the Taiwan Strait crisis was forgotten as one of the important rationales behind the negotiation and eventual signing of the Visiting Forces Agreement as, of course, the two allies started to focus first on the war of terror in the aftermath of 9-11. Then, of course, the shift of Philippine attention away from internal security to the South China Sea dispute in around 2011. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So uh, the impact of the Ukraine-Russia war. Next slide, please. So you have, of course, the, uh, ha the war happened. Initially, the Philippines, President Duterte, tried to maintain what I called a critical neutrality. But eventually, after some briefing from the Philippine military, President Duterte got convinced that there was a possibility that China might repeat what uh, Russia did with Ukraine. So this basically was the reason why suddenly, despite his, you know, initially he was so anti-American, he instructed the Philippine ambassador to Washington, D.C., who is still currently our ambassador in Washington, D.C., Ambassador Babe Somaldez, to offer the possible use of, you know, American facilities, facilities, especially Clark Air Base, just in case. Now, he said, just in case the war spreads into the Indo-Pacific region. I think he was really referring to the fact that China might take a page from <laughs> Russia's handbook regarding, of course, in the invading a you know a country that it you know China and Russia would claim as their part, uh, uh, you know, formerly the part of China, which is of course Taiwan. Next slide, please. So the proposal, of course, also seen as an attempt to recalibrate uh, the alliance after, of course, you have. Uh, the alliance being in one way or the other diminished during the early part of the Duterte administration. Next slide, please. So uh, the underlying reason, of course, is the fact that like other Southeast Asian countries, President Duterte, despite his anti-American uh, sentiment, you know, saw the possibility that, of course, China might follow suit in the South China Sea and more significantly in the, you know, in the Taiwan Straits, or of course in Taiwan. And of course, again, this is a recognition on his part that you know, despite his effort to appease China, China has still continued its aggressive and coercive action against the Philippines, you know, especially in the South China Sea and probably, of course, in, the, in Taiwan. Next slide, please. <coughs> so, Don, Grant, this is, of course, uh, what I mentioned earlier. So even President Duterte in the latter part of his term basically took into account that China indeed has expansionist goal not only in the South China Sea, West Philippine Sea, but also against Taiwan. Next slide, please. So express willingness to allow American forces to use the Philippines as a staging ground. And this, of course, started a series of development that improved that led to the improvement of Philippine-U.S. security relations. Eventually, of course, he decided to, uh, to end the termination process of the Visiting Forces Agreement that he tried to abrogate in February 2020. Then by November 2021, the Philippines and the United States came out with a joint vision for the alliance. So what you see is you know, a dramatic improvement that's happening in terms of our Philippine-U.S. alliance actually began during the latter part of the Duterte administration, primarily because Duterte realized that China might be really serious and, of course, crossing the Taiwan Strait and effecting, uh, you know, an invasion of Taiwan, which would affect about 160,000 Filipino workers that are, of course, based in Taiwan. Next slide, please. So uh, just let's proceed, but uh, nothing came out. Uh, there was no negotiation at that time, rather. Uh, there's still, of course, feeling in Washington, D.C., or even here in the, uh, in the U.S. Embassy in Manila, that Duterte might not be that serious. But actually, he was. You know, he basically realized that it doesn't pay to appease China. So let's see what's been happening recently. I'll just breeze through this. Next slide, please. So this happened last year uh, during the meeting between Secretary Lloyd Austin, then the officer in charge of the Department of National Defense, Jose Paustino, who, of course, announced their commitment to reaffirmation 
of the commitment to the 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty. Next slide, please. Advance also admitted the necess uh, necessity <coughs> of modernizing the alliance. Modernizing refers, of course, to the fact that it had to shift into other areas away from the South China Sea and that the Philippine-U.S. alliance has to be linked with other U.S. alliances, specifically, of course, the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty and even, of course, the U.S.-Australian Security Relations. Next slide, please. So there's some of the discussion. You have more military exercises that would be conduct conducted this year from 250 last year to about 500. Next slide, please. Both sides also agreed to ensure robust military to military relations and conduct, uh, of course, what is being discussed right now here in Manila are, of course, joint maritime exercises not only between the Philippines and the United States, but also with the inclusion of Japan and Australia. Next slide, please. More significantly, of course, what was announced uh, early February, that the, a, uh, uh, the increase in a number of uh, what we call joint location or what we call enhanced defense cooperation sites. They are, of course, American, you know, their infrastructures that will be improved or built by the U.S. military inside five Philippine Air Force bases. Now, of course, there's supposed to be an increase of four. People are, you know, people here are speculating that this might involve port facilities that will be useful for the uh, United States Navy and, of course, the United States Marine Corps. Next slide, please. So, sites will provide, of course, U.S. forces with strategic vantage point from which, of course, they can mount operation if push comes to shove, not only in the South China Sea, but more importantly, in Taiwan. Next slide, please. So at the same time, you have, of course, dramatic increase in uh, joint exercises. Balikatan uh, this year will involve about 17,000 Philippine, U.S., and uh, Australian forces with probably the Japanese sending of servers. You know, a significant contingent that will be involved again in Bali Balikatan exercise is the newly formed uh, U.S. Marine Littoral Regiment that, of course, is also training with its Philippine counterpart. So even the Philippines had formed a Littoral Marine Battalion that definitely, of course, would be used in, you know, in push comes to shove situation, uh, not probably on, uh, just in the South China Sea, but, you know, in other possible scenarios. Next slide, please. So what would be the impact of the increase in EDCA sites? Of course, in increased training. Uh, it's envisioned that, uh, air, you know, units, squadrons from the United States Marine Corps, the United States Air Force, uh, and, of course, even the United States Navy could use those air bases to, of course, be acclimated uh, into, you know, possible war fighting scenarios in a Southeast Asian tropical environment. Next slide, please. Then, of course, forward facilities for the United States Navy and United States Marine Corps ships. Uh, those would be forward facilities that might be used uh, in northern Luzon. Next slide, please. And of course, if push comes to shove, launching pads for uh, U.S. air, naval, and even, of course, amphibious operation coming, of course, from northern Luzon. Next slide, please. So this is, in a way, there is a sort of acceptance now in the Philippine government of the possibility that, you know, the Philippines would have to honor its treaty obligation with the United States. And, of course, given... Our geographic proximity, you know, uh, with Taiwan, you know, we have no choice but, of course, to uh, honor, again, our treaty obligation to our only formal treaty ally, that's, of course, the United States. Next slide, please. So Manila is now aware that if an armed conflict between Taiwan, Beijing and Taiwan erupts and identify, we cannot, of course, accept the collateral damages or the impact. We'll have in terms of private return of Filipino overseas workers, which is, of course, the primary concern of the government and, of course, the possibility 
that the conflict might spread from um, Taiwan across the uh, Luzon, Str Luzon Strait and even, of course, northern Luzon. Next slide, please. Marcus administration, of course, had found it necessary to improve Philippine security relations as it openly expressed the need to cooperate with Washington in possible strategic contingency, of course, in, the, in Taiwan uh, and, of course, even the South China Sea. Next slide, please. So, uh, although President Marcos has not explicitly stated that this country would assist the United States in any armed conflict, uh, this, of course, stems from the fact that, you know, as any other leader, you don't want to be your country to be dragged in any other conflict. But in his more recent statement, there seems to be an acceptance that because of geography, because of our treaty obligation, and the fact that arm, you know, armed neutrality is not an option. Simply because the Philippines, of course, has been so focused on internal security, it simply doesn't have the credible military capability to even contemplate the prospect of armed neutrality. At the end of the day, there's a recognition that we have to rely on our force, our treaty, our uh, treaty obligation with the United States. Next slide, please. So the last statement, of course, was his speech. And just about uh, just last week, during uh, his visit to the Western Command, he told the units of the Navy and the Air Force, we really have to take into account geopolitical realities. So we have to focus away from internal security to, of course, what happened beyond our maritime borders. I end my presentation here, and I look forward to a very a, a dynamic uh, conversation. <laughs> All right, Dr. DeCastro, thank you very much. I would say on uh, on two points, uh, both for a, a very comprehensive uh, and informative uh, presentation there, uh, as well as for the very generous use of cartoons, of which I am I'm always a, a very big fan. Um, and uh, so I enjoyed it very much on uh, on both of those uh, those two accounts. Um, I, I jotted down a few questions of my own, uh, but I'm going to hold off on those. Uh, as points to uh, uh, delve into uh, a bit more uh, later. Uh, but again, but thank you very much, sir. Um, I think next I will turn the floor over to Dr. Aoki uh, from the Rand Corporation to speak with us about uh, uh, both the, uh, the way that these issues have played out in, in Japan and in the, uh, the Asia Pacific region. Dr. Aoki, the, the floor is yours, ma'am. Um, thank you. Um, thank you um, for involving me in this very important conversation. Um, I should. I have to start with a disclaimer that the, uh, what I'm about to say is my personal opinion. It's not the Rand corporations, um, and I will today. I will talk a little bit about Japan's threat perception, what Japan is doing to to deal with the threats, and a little bit about um, Japan's constraints in in terms of dealing with these um, the, the threats that it faces. The bottom line is that. Concerns over tensions across the Taiwan Strait is a major, major motivation for um, why people, more people, um, both in terms of like, and in terms of the political elites in Japan, um, want stronger defense measures um, today for the country. And um, Japan is trying to strengthen its own defenses, not just by acquiring new capabilities, but also by enhancing security cooperation, of course, with the United States, but with others as well. So first I'll go over some of the um, threat, um, threats that Japan, um, Japan is concerned about. First and foremost is the tensions across, uh, across the Taiwan Strait. So at the top of the list, um, there was a um, the presentation earlier talk about the pro geographical proximity between Taiwan and the Philippines. Japan is also close um, to Taiwan. The westernmost island of Yunnanmi is about 70 miles or 110 kilometers um, from Taiwan. So that's pretty close. And that's one element. And there are um, renewed, the concerns are renewed um, because of a couple of reasons. Well, one of which is that this is the tensions are are um, are in, uh, taking place at a time of strategic competition between the United States and China. What this means, this could be a flashpoint where it could trigger a major war um, between two major powers that could have consequences, devastating consequences for everybody. 
And um, against this background, um, Japan's, uh, the Japanese people's affinity toward Taiwan is growing as well. So in an opinion conducted in late 2021 in Japan, 75.9%, so 76% of Japanese people said that they feel close to Taiwan. And that 71.4% said that Japan-Taiwan relations were good. This contrasts with the same poll in late 2016, whose numbers were 66.5% and 60.2, respectively. 66.5 and 60.2 is not bad at all, but it has increased considerably. And um, this means that there's the broader public in Japan care, cares about um, Taiwan, which of course matters for Japanese politics. If you, 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 Japan is not at the point where you know you well, you have official uh, relations with Taiwan, but Japan and Taiwan have un vibrant unofficial um, ties, and um, it, it also means that you know all the, the, the political leaders um, have more reason. To, it's being pushed by the public to care more about um, Taiwan. Um, other um, issues, other threats that Japan um, faces include uh, tensions over the Senkaku Islands. Um, this has been going on, as you probably know, from the 20, uh, early 2010s. Um, there were a couple of incidents that um, heightened the tensions there. Um, especially in 2020, uh, sorry, 2012, 2012, when Japan utilized the islands by purchasing them from a private um, landowner to reinforce administrative control and prevent private groups from visiting. Well, this raised tensions, China's um, incursions into the air and, um, you know, sea around that area increased from that time period it has um continued um but it's uh but it, it's kind of, it's a little bit it has become a little bit of a regular um kind of event obviously this is concern but um it's not as um sort of at the forefront of people's minds as they were probably in a, a, little, a couple of years ago North Korea is quantitatively and qualitatively improving its nuclear and missile arsenal, um, test firing missiles, um, dozens of missiles, and um, one of which flew over Japan in October 2022 last year for the first time in five years. So this is also obviously a concern for Japan. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is also a concern for Japan because this is a case in which a revisionist power is trying to stay, uh, change the status quo using uh, by using force. So this is um, a reason why uh, Japan is concerned at both at the political elite level and the ordinary public. And another point that is perhaps not getting as much attention, um, but nevertheless, nevertheless important, I think, is the um, cooperation between and among China, um, Russia, and North Korea in the wake of the war um, in Ukraine. So if I were a Japanese defense official, I would be worrying about um, a Taiwan, a possible Taiwan contingency and something happening on the northern side of Japan, so uh, in on its border with um, Russia. Um, Chinese and Russians have been conducting bomber, strategic bomber runs around Japan. This, is, this predates the war in Ukraine, but this is a level of co cooperation that has developed over, over time. And um, with, um, depending on how this cooperation, both um, between and among the three countries, um, how they pan out is going to uh, matter a lot for Japan. And uh, this, of course, because Japan has had to worry about China and North Korea, and now it um, has to worry about uh, possibly hostile Russia um, as well. So, and I would also know that this is also because Japan chose to um, swiftly condemn Russia for its actions um, in Ukraine and um, imposed um, an unprecedented, unprecedented level of sanctions making <laughs> Russia in the wake of the war in Ukraine. So what is Japan doing to deal with this situation? 
So as I mentioned, all this has heightened the, the um, threat perceptions, um, both among the political elite and the ordinary public, um, in the ordinary Japanese in the country. And there is a stronger support for defense measures, which has translated into um, an increase in defense spending. So J Japan's budget for fiscal 2023, which begins in April, on April 1st, is 6.8 trillion yen. That's about $50 billion, and that is a 26% increase from the year to the year before. Um, this is the first budget under the new um, national security strategy, which was published along with two other documents, the um, National Defense Program Guidelines and the Midterm Defense Plan. And these were um, released last year, and in the national security strategy, um, Japan, uh, that, that includes a target to increase defense funding to 2% of GDP in 2027. This will make Japan um, the third biggest defense spender in the world. So this is uh, a fairly um, significant development. Um, this is a shift, of course, from Japan's um, previous target. It, it's a, this is an informal guideline, informal cap, but nevertheless uh, maintained for a long time of 1% of GDP um, in terms of defense spending. And um, this was um, partly to signal Japan's intention that it will remain what it translates as exclusively defense-oriented policy. Now, of course, Japan has not abandoned this exclusively defense-oriented policy, but it is thinking of new ways in which um, it could defend itself and there's political capital to make some of these um, those steps happen. Um, I should also uh, explain a little bit about the exclusively defense-oriented policy. It means that defense force can only be um, used in an event of an attack, and that the extent of the use of that force should be the minimum necessary for self-defense, and that Japan should maintain defense capabilities um, that um, that is limited to the minimum necessary for self-defense. So um, I just talked about the increase in defense um, spending. Well, what is Japan going to do with that money? Well, one of the major measures that received a lot of attention was Japan's plan to acquire counter-strike capabilities. So um, this is the ability to attack enemy missile bases um, when an attack is imminent. And um, this is another step that Japan had um, said earlier, it actually from the 1950s, that it's actually legal for Japan to do this. That was the Japanese government's legal interpretation of the um, of its you know legal constraints. But they didn't really. It was not political politically possible until this time. So um, Japan is considering um, different types of missiles, including the purchase of um, hundreds of US-made Tomahawk cruise missiles. It's also trying to domestically develop hypersonic supply vehicles with a maximum range of 3,000 kilometers in the first half of the 2030s. Um, so what is Japan doing apart from acquiring new capabilities? Well, Japan views its alliance with the United States as a cornerstone of its security policy, but it is strengthening its security cooperation with, uh, cooperation with other countries bilaterally and uh, multilaterally. Um, that is the case with the Philippines, um, but also with um, the striking case is the Japan Security Cooperation with Australia. It signed a renewed, Japan signed a renewed joint declaration on security cooperation last year. And while this is not a formal treaty or legally binding, together with the reciprocal access <laughs> agreement that the two countries signed in 2022, they aim to make it possible for the two countries to um, to defense forces to operate together seamlessly. Japan is also active in multilateral um, exercises as well as um, the Quad um, Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which groups Australia, India, um, Japan, and the United States. Of course, the Quad says it's not a security grouping; it's not a defense um, organization. Um, but there are some security elements to it. They do cooperate over dual use technologies, for example, and the four countries that are involved in the quad are all in the Malabar exercises, for example. 
And uh, more importantly, the organization aims to promote the free and open rules based order. This means that it's still it's, it's aiming to shape a favorable balance of power in the region. Um, so those are some of the examples of what Japan is doing. So, so I talked a little bit about how Japan faces constraints as well. I'll go over a little bit of those. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Japan maintains its exclusively self um, exclusively self defense policy, and in terms of Taiwan, any action Japan uh, could take in a possible crisis will depend on the top level leadership decisions judgments about the nature of that particular incident, and uh, this is all include things like how it began, how Taiwan and Washington have responded and how um, Japan perceives the threat to itself. There are three categories, main categories, um, for this, the, um, the threats that they can, um, that Japan can um, categorize them into. And one is called the important influence situation. Second one is called survival threatening uh, situation. And third one is armed, the armed, armed attack situation. And they all differ um, in terms of what Japan can do. For example, if it's an important influence situation, the self defense the defense forces can provide logistical support. Um, but it can it can um, it can exercise a, a, the right to self a collective self defense um, only if it's deemed a survival threatening situation. So the second category. And the armed attack situation would be, um, as you can imagine, you know, Japan could defend itself. So, um, so there are, you know, different categories, um, and that's going to depend on what the situation, what that particular situation is. There is a new sense of urgency and openness to deepen bilateral planning with Washington in Japan um, to enhance deterrence and to prepare options if deterrence fails. Um, so, in terms of Japan, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for Japan to say Japan will defend Taiwan. But of course, Japan can say it will defend itself. And by um, acquiring capabilities to defend itself, that might also have the, um, and that hopefully has the, um, the, the effect of, of complicating the strategic calculus of the PRC. Um, so that's what you can, one of the things that Japan can do and, and is doing. And in, in addition to that, it could further strengthen bi bilateral cooperation with um, other likely countries so that there is what some people call the thickening of the web of security cooperation in that region and just generally you know, create resilience, increase resilience and help shape a um, favorable balance of power in the region. Um, this could be particularly important, as I said, in, as um, we may see a further um, strengthening of cooperation between um, China, North Korea, and Russia. Thank you. All right, Dr. Aoki, thank you very much uh, for, again, a very uh, comprehensive uh, overview. I've been making some notes to myself, but I think one of the uh, perils of being a moderator is when the panelists do give uh, such comprehensive discussions uh, of an issue it makes it trickier to uh, to ask <laughs> questions later. Uh, but I'll still uh, I'll be uh, doing my best. Um, now, and last and certainly not least, I would like to turn to uh, Lieutenant General uh, Wallace Chip Gregson to discuss with us uh, some of the ways in which uh, uh, these events or developments may have affected uh, U.S. defense policy uh, in the uh, in the Pacific. And we do have oh we do have a graphic. Good. All right, uh, General, I will turn the floor over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me first endorse uh, the presentation by Dr. Cruz and Dr. Ryoki. I, I fully associate myself with all the observations and conclusions therein. I'd like also to make note of one particular one that Dr. Ryoki made. Conflict anywhere in East Asia is likely to very quickly become conflict everywhere. You got three revisionist uh, governments there, China, Russia, North Korea, uh, there's no reason that uh, if it's conflict starts in the south that the 
two countries up to the north are not going to want to take advantage of that. So uh, the, the American cabinet is kind of segmenting these uh, conflicts in the different areas. Uh, there is some cause. Uh, let me explain the uh, uh, chart that we've got up here. Uh, it's not a Mercator projection. Uh, it shows uh, countries in a more accurate relation to each other, and it certainly shows a better depiction of the distances involved, be they short or be they long. Uh, the first and second island chain are, are shown in their proper relations. Uh, our, our vital interest, of course, lie, lie along the first island chain. It is in our interest to protect the territory, the interest in the lives of our allies and friends, specifically including Taiwan. Uh, Okinawa is shown, and Americans tend to think of Okinawa as one island. It's actually hundreds of islands that form the barrier of the East China Sea. And as Dr. Aoki pointed out, Yonaguni is 70 miles or less. Uh, from Taiwan, it's actually south of Taipei in latitude. Uh, Japan recently put uh, self defense force units down for surveillance, and uh, they're building up other capabilities there, along with other islands in the archipelago. This chart, in my memory, made its first appearance in every official government office during the Abe administration. And it's certainly an indication of the way Japan is looking at the distances. Uh, I mentioned the second island chain. Uh, it's all there on the map, including the relations uh, from Duo to the to the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, to Yap, which belongs to the Federated States of Micronesia, Republic of Palau, and Mactan in the Philippines. Uh, it's one that won the Yap to Palau to Mactan are hops easily made by a short range helicopter, just to give you a uh, the, the degree of appreciation for the military geography here. Our logistics are likely to be based across this chart here, uh, including islands whose names resonate with, with history, but with some distinct differences from the past. Now all are within the range of our enemies, thanks to long range precision weapons uh, that technology for us. Geography is not changing, but changes in technology and national ambitions and it changed the security offered by a region's geography. It has some old habits to break. For, for the last half of the 20th century and into this century, geography offered a degree of stability between continental nations and maritime nations. <clears throat> we came rushing back to Asia in 1950 as a result of the Korean War and the onset of the Cold War. In those days, Japan became the rear area it's in, in, in its day, the UN Rear Command from Korea still resides in Japan at Dakota Air Force Base, and Korea was a combat theater. So Japan became the sanctuary, Korea became the combat theater. The, the, our friends and allies enjoyed a degree of success and security behind unchallenged U.S. air and sea superiority. We could go where we wanted, project forces ashore as we wished, stay, along, stay as long as we wanted, uh, et cetera. Those days are now gone. It used to be the continental nations, specifically China and North Korea, had no way to project power out, out to seaward. That's changed, as Dr. Aoki mentioned about the missiles. Uh, it's, it's, it, there's, uh, uh, China's uh, constructed a vast missile arsenal across their entire geographic sanctuary. North Korea, despite decades of sanctions that we continually say are the strongest ever, et cetera, uh, North Korea continues charging on on our missile program and our nuclear program. Uh, anything pervasive surveillance and weapons act from a distance are the new reality. Anything that can be found can be attacked and nothing can hide if it's big. We increasingly speak of the literals, especially regarding the first island chain. Literal is defined by the U.S. Defense Department as two segments of the operational environment. The seaward is the area from the open ocean to the shore, which must be controlled to support operations ashore. And the landward is the area inland from the shore that can be supported and defended directly from the sea. Reduced to plain language minus the jargon. The literal is the area where forces in one terrestrial domain 
can have a decisive effect on forces in the other terrestrial domain. In days of sail, this was defined by the range of cannons. In those days, it was said a ship is a fool to fight a fort. You can think of the British at Fort McHenry up the road in Baltimore. Uh, later, the literal was defined by the range of airplanes and major caliber weapons. Now, thanks to long range precision weapons and pervasive surveillance, the literal is greatly expanded and almost limitless. With this de facto explanation of literal, the stability of our deterrence is based on the maritime democracy, based on the maritime democracies of East Asia, is reduced. This is an it follows that if forces on land and sea can affect each other at greater, greater and greater distances, then it is no longer useful to talk about separate and sequential sea, land, and air operations. This is an age of joint power and service adaptation to the conditions. Part of the United States Air Force answer to being within the Chinese weapons engagement zone is something they call their Agile Combat Employment, or ACE, naturally, for the Air Force. <laughs> the U.S. Transportation Command is not an armed service as we think of armed services, but its, but its support is crucial for our forward force. Transcom looks at the theater in terms of access, ACing, and overflight, or OVO and the inevitable Defense Department acronym. The U.S. Army also has major responsibility short of the battle area in the Joint Force. Access is not something that starts with the war. It's an important function now and will get even more important. Theater security cooperation is the military component of what must be a national effort to ensure our access, facing, and operations across the nations of the Pacific to support any operation in Asia. Included in theater security cooperation is the training of Taiwan's forces. We're beginning to break the isolation of those forces since 1979. We have uh, trainers both in Taiwan and we are bringing, the, we are in bringing larger and larger Taiwan formations to the United States to train here. The Air Force is facing uh, uh, problem, they have, quote, uh, in their words, they have studied every single piece of concrete, concrete in the Pacific to find new places to fight from. The vast distance of the Pacific region and the growing reach of the Chinese military has led the U.S. to look for ways to disperse its forces and their bases. For the U.S. Air Force, this means scouring the region for runways and facilities that can support aircraft as they try to spread out and sustain potential combat operations. According to the Pacific Air Force commander, what we're doing is taking advantage of airfields that already exist. We're going to put an F-22 or a F-15 or a C-130 into an airfield, it has to have certain criteria. So we've actually studied every single piece of concrete in the Pacific, et cetera. The Air Force did this in the 1990s. They looked at it, uh, they experimented with it in Alaska. Fortunately, the officer that was in command in Alaska is now the commanding general of the PACAP, so he knows the territory on which he's embarking. On, on the Navy side, according to Admiral Paparo, the commander of the Pacific Fleet, the Navy needs to shed 20 years of how it rearmed and repaired its fleet and prepare for a, for a future of increased risk in contested logistics. The old way the U.S. moved material forward in the most cost-effective manner is no longer sufficient for how the Navy and Marines will fight in the future. Uh, quoting Admiral Paparo, operating in uncontested environments, our logistics enterprises operate on business principles. Those business principles were to resupply the force of maximum efficiency so the American taxpayer dollar could be applied to combat power at the greatest point of need. In our operational plans for high-end combat, we've got to think less in terms of maximum efficiency and more in terms of maximum effect. Reality of vulnerable supply lines for naval units forward and difficulty repairing and rearming ships forward has become a tricky problem set for the Navy and Marines that are shaping concepts to fight spread across the sea. Answering a question on fixing battle damage ships, Admiral Parparo described a, quote, art of contested sustainment that is not precisely at the zone of fire, 
The doors, in fact, way in the rear where we normally expect to be able to execute those activities in a sanctuary. For example, for part of described flyaway repair teams that could make battle damage ships for repairs, including equipment that could be transported to the point of need. Paro said that the fleet had experimented with rearming ships at sea and flyaway repair teams at the recent Valiant Shield of the Pacific Exercise Series. Logistics conversation came as Paparo outlined a growing boldness of Chinese actions in the Western Pacific, citing the recent lacing of a Philippine Coast Guard vessel on a resupply mission by a Chinese ship and a continued ballistic missile testing and air and sea exercises around Taiwan. The Marine Literal Regiment is one part of a larger force design intended to remedy challenges created by the continued evolution the character of warfare, particularly the proliferation of what's also called the mature precision strike regime. And MLR will be self deployable multi domain task force optimized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And without the jargon, we plan to fight in a widely distributed, politically sustainable, operationally resilient posture with small formations between, between 10 and 40 personnel. Scattered across the first island chain literal, these forces will be agile and mobile and armed with weapons accurate at distance. We're talking hundreds of miles but that can integrate with other joint forces to, to, to seize and ensure sea control. Uh, the, these small forces, because of their size, their, their agility, they can hide in the terrain, they can shelter within the terrain. And therefore, become survivable, and if we spread out enough targets, we prevent, we present the Chinese or the North Koreans or the Russians with a targeting problem that they cannot solve. Um, there's a we're, we're also pursuing special ships for these forces. Uh, it's sometimes called the light amphibious warship. The name is not important, but. Uh, again, this is another small ship that can hide within the within the clutter on the radar and the satellite pictures borrowed from the technology that developed in Australia to support their mineral uh, extraction industry. They're called stern landing ships. So this is another adaptation to uh, more effectiveness by uh, more, uh, more uh, economy or efficiency. We stop there. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much, General, again, for a uh, uh, very comprehensive uh, discussion that uh, that leaves a lot of ground for uh, uh, further discussion. But I very much appreciate the way in which you are uh, particularly able to uh, take some of the uh, U.S. military jargon. To, I you used to constantly complain myself uh, in my own days in uniform that the U.S. military had forgotten how to speak English and uh, spoke uh, largely in acronym and buzzword. Uh, but I think you did uh, an excellent job in uh, in presenting uh, some of these concepts in uh, in, in layman's terms. Um, I think uh, we'll now move to uh, the Q and A uh, portion of our, our seminar today. And once again, uh, I would uh, welcome questions both uh, from those who are attending uh, in person here in our live audience, as well as uh, for those who uh, may be joining us uh, online. Um, if you are uh, watching the, uh, the presentations uh, remotely, uh, once again, you can uh, submit questions either through the, uh, the chat window function in, in YouTube, if you're watching it that way, or you can also email questions to uh, contact at globaltaiwan.org. Uh, um, I think as we're getting ready to move into the q and I, I will exercise a traditional prerogative of the uh, moderator uh, to ask a question or two. And again, as I said, one of the perils of uh, having uh, panelists who present very comprehensive uh, overviews of their topics, it can make it uh, a little bit trickier to uh, to ask questions. But I, I did still have a number that I had uh, noted uh, down, and perhaps uh, even if it's not entirely new, perhaps uh, areas that we could drill down into uh, a little bit further. Um, and I think the first question I will present is one to both uh, Dr. DeCastro and to Dr. Uh, Aoki. Um, in discussing uh, these very substantive uh, changes in defense policy that have occurred both in, in the Philippines and Japan, it seems to me that, um, you know, it's come out in the discussions that a lot of these things would have seemed uh, politically impossible just, uh, just a few years ago. And so obviously there's been a uh, very substantial change 
um, in public opinion in the body politic in these countries that, that has uh, allowed that to happen. So I think uh, and so for example for Dr. De Castro again and this was covered in the uh, in the presentation but yeah I thought perhaps draw it out maybe a little more. Um, you know we have seen some uh, very dramatic shifts uh, in the Philippines between uh, the last couple of presidential administrations. With first uh, with uh, when President Duterte came into office, he did seem to have um, uh, a very sort of you know anti-American attitude, and with that also seemed to want to um, uh, build or uh, closer relations with, with the PRC. And as Dr. Casper discussed in his uh, presentation, that that changed, and you and we've seen a different attitude on the part of the. Uh, uh, of the the new presidential administration of Ferdinand Marcos, but again, it was changing even before um, that uh, changeover administrations took place. So, I want to see if we could draw a little bit more uh, for Dr. Castro. What you thought the most prominent or important factors were in bringing about uh, that shift? Again, is it the the concern of a, a conflict over Taiwan? Is it the maritime incidents that have occurred between Chinese and, and Philippine ships? Uh, and so forth. So, what and just again, just kind of try a little bit more as to what has brought about that change. And similarly, uh, for you, Dr. Aoki, uh, in Japan as well. And as, as we were discussing before the, uh, the seminar began, it has been really uh, startling, very dramatic how uh, uh, opinions in Japan have changed uh, so dramatically. And again, I wanted to try maybe just a little bit more in detail. Um, I guess first, Sort of the reasons for that, that that has taken place and perhaps in conjunction with that, um, in, what you would see or how you would analyze sort of possible uh, continuing, you know, so, you know, objections or debate to these uh, changes in Japanese defense policy, which again, are quite dramatic. So perhaps uh, maybe if I could go to Dr. DeCastro first, um, if you're uh, with us, sir, uh, how, how would uh, well, I hear? Yes, sir. <laughs> Well, uh, I think the very important factor there is you have to look at the, you know, an institution. And I'm referring, of course, to the armed forces of the Philippines. President Duterte really, you know, was determined to make that shift. I don't know if you still remember uh, in October 2016, when he announced in Beijing, I'm moving away from the United States. After he returned back from Beijing and he went to Manila, the armed forces asked him, what do you mean by shifting away from the United States? So, he, of course, also during that period, he announced no more military exercises with the United States. Again, of course, the military asked him why. You know, we could still conduct military exercises with our ally in terms of humanitarian assistance, counterterrorism, support, and so on. And also during the you know his term of office. He tried to basically invite a number of Chinese uh, projects here in the Philippines. This was opposed by the military. You know, just an important case. Uh, there is an island in northern Luzon. It's just, uh, you know, just uh, in the corner of Luzon, Pacific Ocean, and the South China Sea. You have a Chinese company that wanted to build a, you know, a city, you know, a mega city. This was opposed by the Philippine Navy. The Philippine Navy pointed out, if the Chinese control this island, the name of the island is Fuga Island. So if the Chinese would control this, they will have basically control of the Luzon Strait. So it was also the military that gave a briefing to President Duterte about the possibility that you might have a conflict in Taiwan and it would affect, of course, the Philippines. And of course, the military was also instrumental in, again, telling this current administration, we have to improve our alliance with the United States simply because no matter we appease China or not, China would still pursue its maritime expansion. China will still continue its course of action against, of course, the Philippine Coast Guard and the Philippine military. So this the military has provided a degree of stability in, of course, ensuring that the alliance is maintained. So, of course, in the terms of public opinion, uh, you know, it's been consistent. 85% uh, of the Filipinos have a very high trust rating with the United States and, of course, Japan. China usually will have the lowest. But the most important is to what institution does a Filipino president listen to? And, of course, the obvious answer, of course, is the Philippine military. 
So, of course, it has some also something to do with its strong institutional linkage with the U.S. Armed Forces. So it had basically maintained that outlook, and of course, it's very much protective of its institutional relationship with the Armed Forces of the United States. So this is something, of course, if you have to be in Washington, this is something I have to look at how I could maintain that stability, that institutional uh, uh, basis of our two countries' alliance. Dr. Katz, yes, thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, Dr. Aoki? Um, thank you for the question. So um, I think it is a combination of um, various elements that, that are um, behind this strong support um, in Japan for um, stronger defense measures and obviously the tensions in Taiwan and North Korea. And I was talking with um, General Gregson earlier about how the Russian invasion of Ukraine has had an impact on Japan. Um, and one of and this is not just because it's a revisionist power trying to change the status quo with military force, but it's also shown how the um, traditional pathways of the government or the international support um, when things like this happen, particularly even the Security Council isn't really functioning in the way that, um, you know, the, uh, the countries that really want to maintain the rules-based order, um, it does, it's not working the way it, it has and it should. Um, and obviously, you know, General Gregson um, speak for himself about this, but I agree with that, um, that view. And this is particularly important for Japan to, uh, because of Taiwan, but also because of North Korea, right? Because North Korea is able to um, basically improve its um, missile and nuclear arsenal because China and Russia are on its side, and and North Korea has not, we have not, and collectively been able to say anything about North Korea's test firing of an ICBM. So. Um, this is clearly not working, and this is one of the sources of concern for Japan. And I will also note that you know a lot of what's happening right now was part of former Prime Minister um, Shinzo Abe's vision. Um, he was instrumental in um, institutionalizing a quad, for example. And the idea behind that was that Japan, yes, obviously, the United States, Japan should cooperate with the United States. That was a cornerstone of Japan's security policy. But Japan should also try to cooperate with others, like-minded countries, in order to create a favorable environment. So that's you know, part of what Japan is doing. It's clearly stated in the, um, the national security um, strategy, uh, but that has, that has its roots in um, the fact, you know, in Prime Minister Abe's administration. And Prime Minister Abe, former Prime Minister Abe, was um, a strong proponent for a, a 2% GDP defense spending. Um, and this was um, not exactly, it didn't have huge support when he started saying it, but by the time he was um, killed um, last year, um, it, it had support for this idea had grown by that time. So, and in terms of debate um, in Japan, um, of course, there is continuing debate about um, various aspects of Japan's um, security policy, including what counterstrike capabilities mean and under what conditions should Japan employ those um, capabilities. And that's a debate that's still on. Thank you, Dr. Aoki. Okay. I think I had one more question, uh, which, uh, again, I'm using the uh, moderator's prerogative. Uh, I'd like to direct to you, General Brixham. Um, you touched upon this uh, briefly in your presentation when you were mentioning um, the Taiwan military having been <laughs> in a state of professional isolation for some time. You mentioned some of the recent steps uh, to come out of, again, which I believe you referred to as the, the 1979 or post-1979 post uh, isolation. And it's something that you and I had discussed a little bit uh, offline, but perhaps to, uh, at the risk of putting you on the spot uh, a little bit, I wanted to ask, based on your own uh, experience with that, what you would see as sort of the, the greatest needs in terms of international cooperation and international engagement uh, for Taiwan's military forces in terms of engaging either with the U.S. or whether it's with, uh, with other uh, countries in the, the Asia Pacific region. In sort of in terms of the greatest needs they would have for professionalization and, and how they might benefit the most from sort of more cooperative engagement. Do you have uh, any any thoughts on that? Uh, I do. Thank you. Uh, 
And uh, part of the uh, part of the isolation problem, of course, came with the uh, change in recognition of, uh, of who's going to sit in the UN seat uh, and other things that grew up around that. Uh, since that time, uh, we've uh, maintained support for Taiwan with various items, military equipment and things, but I don't know that we spent as much time working with, with Taiwan on doctrine and operational concepts. And I think now that the threat picture is changing due to the mature Crusader strike regime or whatever you want to call it, uh, it's, there's, there's ways that we need to work on, uh, on making this better. The uh, introduction of U.S. trainers to Taiwan echoes what we did with Ukraine in 2014 after uh, Crimea was uh, taken by the Russians. Uh, the Ukrainians' uh, uh, skill and uh, dedication and courage had a lot to do with Ukrainian resistance, but uh, perhaps the, uh, the the, the sending of trainers to Ukraine after 2014 had something to do with it too, and I think this is uh, part of it. Uh, we have long debates in this country about what we're going to do with Guam, and particularly the inner service uh, things uh, and politics going on in this, the institutional things as, as Dr. Smith mentioned, uh, had a lot to do with uh, what we think we were trying to do with Guam, Saipan, and places there on the first island chain. One of the things I would offer is that Due to Guam's location, it's a great place for uh, training with uh, U.S. forces, Japanese forces in Guam and in the surrounding areas. We're talking about defending a series of islands, which really is what Taiwan is. Then you've got Guam, and then you've got 13 or 14 islands in the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas, uh, where we could do some modest uh, exercising. Uh, uh, that uh, might might help with the development of uh, of, of operational concepts. Uh, it's no, uh, uh, the uh, Taiwan Air Force, the Taiwan Navy, uh, as far as I know, uh, don't have any particular uh, recruitment problems or gaining problems. The Taiwan Army does, uh, but I think the creation of a, a, an operational concept or a series of operational concepts that are intuitively understandable by the public may have a, uh, uh, something to offer on uh, uh, decreasing the uh, recruiting challenges facing in Taiwan for us. All right, uh, thank you very much, General. I do have a few of the questions jotted down, but I, I don't wish to unduly uh, abuse the uh, moderator's uh, prerogative uh, further. And I do want to open up the floor. <laughs> Uh, Siri may have a question for us. Um, I think what I will do. Siri going to talk to you. Um, I think what I will do is I may try to, to alternate uh, questions between our, our live audience and some of those uh, joining us uh, online. So I, I think that we'll turn first to our studio audience. I did, sir, okay, uh, can we get a microphone to, uh, to this gentleman here? And we'll open up for uh, uh, audience questions at Q&A. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an intelligence analyst, a former diplomat. The number one lesson we learned from Ukraine is that if we had given everything that we intended to give, a year ago, there would be tens of thousands of Ukrainians alive today who are not alive today. We have in no way absorbed that lesson with respect to Taiwan. And I don't see us absorbing that lesson with respect to Taiwan. You'll never get thousands of stingers and high marks and javelins into Taiwan in the next year or two. So they might actually be truly prepared. The alternative model would be to try and gin up production within Taiwan. For example, one of the greatest things you could do would be to reverse engineer the uh, Shahid 146 that is being launched from Russia into uh, Ukraine at the expense of $20,000 per pop instead of $4.6 million per pop for our missiles. Could we set up a reverse engineering production capacity within Taiwan to create this very cost-effective system and laugh at the fact that for once we are reverse engineering someone else's weapons. Okay, thank you, sir. 
Um, and thanks for that question, sir. And, you know, I might um, actually add one or two items um, uh, into that. Uh, I know uh, with something that's been discussed in, in articles that we published in the Global Taiwan Brief for the last year, year and a half, has related, uh, has been related to, rather, some of the efforts that Taiwan's own government has been making towards increased indigenous production of, of some of these uh, uh, munitions. I think that's a, a story that doesn't often get discussed or get as much uh, coverage on, on this side of the ocean uh, anyway, where there's such a uh, uh, focus on, on arms sales to Taiwan rather than what Taiwan is looking to produce itself. But in terms of that sort of weapons production, I, I'd like to take that question, sir. And actually, I think I'll combine it perhaps with one of the questions that we uh, have also received, um, a very a closely related one. Uh, we have uh, Tina Chung with the Voice of America uh, has presented the question, uh, many analysts and people in Congress have said that one of the lessons from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the idea of pre-positioning munitions and military assets in Taiwan um, uh, ahead of, you know, God forbid, a potential blockade or, or other major military operation directed uh, against Taiwan. And she asked, is this something that Washington should contemplate or is currently contemplating? So that does tie in. Uh, to uh, to some of you with your question, sir. Uh, I'll turn that to our panelists. Would uh, any of you like to uh, present a, a response to that or any thoughts on that? Sure, I'll read, I can read on it. Um, thank you. Um, I think that it's a, um, it, uh, an important question and one of the um, geographical kind of um, elements for Taiwan is that it, it's, of course, uh, more difficult to invade, but um, but it's also that also means that it's supplying Taiwan is going to be very difficult, difficult as well. So that's I, I do think that's one of the challenges that um, we have to think about collectively. Um, yeah, and um, so yeah, that, that that's my short comment. I think. Okay. General Richardson, sir. Uh, couldn't agree more with with our. With complaints about our slowness and hitting things to Taiwan. Uh, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier about the difficulty in breaking the paradigms we become used to or the procedures we become used to, and we're bloody slow on uh, getting the things to Taiwan that they've already purchased. It's got to do with, with our acquisition processes and all these things uh, um, that, that we're well familiar with. Uh, in, in, in addition to that, the uh, uh, the, the to, to break that um, is going to require some effort, and I think there's a ray of hope in this new committee that's been formed to to look at China, headed by the uh, congressman from Wisconsin, uh, Mike Gallagher. Yeah, uh, he had some great success. But this is not a political announcement. He had, he had some great success with the first committee meeting and keeping it deep and unpoliticized, which is great. So maybe we can get some accomplishment there. And nothing moves the U.S. acquisition bureaucracy faster than a uh, poke in the eye by Congress. So uh, I have some hopes on this. Um, the other thing I might add on this is that uh, we're very good at, that we Americans are very good at lecturing Taiwan on things. You gotta be a porcupine, you gotta be asymmetric, but we never define the bloody thing. Uh, besides the uh, training uh, provided by the trainers, we need to have some uh, serious, continuing discussions uh, with uh, Taiwanese security forces and their government uh, and, and both officials on, on looking at their operational concepts and figuring out how we better manage the uh, the totality of the problems facing them. Uh, it's not just the island of Taiwan, it's all the other small islands and everything. That, and, and there's ways to do this, but we have to try and break from the shackles of the past and what we've inherited from our past doctrines and past ways of thinking. Those days were over. The, uh, um, uh, the idea that, that the part of what we're doing with the widely distributed things, which is to an advantage, is we will be fighting with our allies in France. We're not going to build new bases, let's say, uh, uh, this character, characterization of what we're doing. We're going to be in small units in places where we're allowed to go. And as Dr. Cruz knows, one of the areas that's been no, opened up now for this type of visiting troops. It's been Palawan, which is 
critical to control the South China Sea. So th there's ways to get at this, uh, and there's ways to to uh, where the Japanese can make a major contribution by doing just what they're doing now. It is enhancing a robust defense of Japanese territory and interests. And with, with with that established, uh, we've got a lot of leverage uh, to help with Taiwan. Love the pin, by the way. <laughs> The crane flag on this one is a little bell thing. Uh, the question, okay, oh, I'll ask. Oh, yeah. no, to our, our uh, own uh, director. Yeah, no, this is an uh, incredible, superb presentation. It's an incredibly informative uh, discussion. Uh, I have two uh, questions. Uh, one is for uh, General Gregson, and the other are for Dr. Cruz and Dr. Aoki. Um, for, uh, uh, for General Gregson, one of the vital treaty allies of the United States that wasn't discussed in today's discussion uh, is the ROK, Republic of Korea. And so I wanted to get your sense in terms of what you see uh, as the human vision, uh, as the optimal role that the ROK could play both politically within the context of the US ROK alliance, but also off of, uh, you know, in the sense of the more broader strategic level, the importance of the ROK uh, in the a Taiwan contingency. Uh, the other questions for Dr. Oyoki and Dr. Cruz uh, Castro are much of our discussion today has been focusing on the communications and planning between the United States and the Philippines and the Japanese. I wonder to what extent there are considerations with Manila and Tokyo about enhancing communication channels directly with Taipei and what are the constraints of that and what are the, the possibilities of that uh, given the growing concerns about a potential Taiwan contingency. Thank you. All right. Uh, perhaps, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, DeCastro, would you perhaps be able to uh, uh, respond to that, sir? Yeah, I can also address to the question regarding the ROK, because last week we had a webinar with the ROK. The ROK is simply focused on what's happening in the Korean Peninsula. You know, uh, I asked this question to the ROK presenter. Aren't you concerned about what might happen in the first island chain? He said, yes, we are concerned. But we simply don't have enough resources to, of course, focus on those other concerns. Plus, of course, the ROK, even up to now, is still very much sensitive to China. You know, they still see China as a possible actor that could constrain North Korea. They still have this notion that if they please China, China would always put a lid on, China, on North Korea. You know, I don't think that is really a very wise move on their part, but they are still stuck with this sort of a, a mind frame that what's only important is the Korean Peninsula. So it will take a lot of effort. Probably in the next few years, you'll be able to, you know, basically I raise also the point. Yeah, you don't want to get involved in, let's say, in Taiwan or South Korea, but just like the Philippines, you have a mutual defense treaty with the United States. You're also obliged to assist the United States, not only north in, in the Korean Peninsula, but also in the, you know, the first island chain. So he said, yeah, probably we would send not a lot, but just basically to minimally fulfill their treaty obligation with the United States. Now, a second question, of course, is in the case of the Philippines, this is very problematic because the Philippines, unlike the United States and Japan, adopts a very legalistic and of course, rigid one China policy. We used to have security ties with Taiwan until 2003, until of course, President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo stopped this very, this informal security relations we had with Taiwan. So we cannot do it. So we have been discussing this with the Japanese and also the Taiwanese. Japan will have to play a very important role and initiating, of course, a bilateral exchange. You have bilateral exchange between Taiwan and Japan. You don't have it with the Philippines directly. So if the Philippines will have to talk with their Taiwanese counterpart, it will have either to be in Tokyo or somewhere in the United States. All right, thank you, Dr. DeCastro. Uh, for our other panelists. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay. Um, sure. So, um, 
in terms of, I, I will also comment a little bit on the ROK question. I think that um, our, um, the concerns for, for the ROK, um, as I said, is the actions of the Americans. And uh, it's a legitimate concern, obviously. And I think what I hear um, often is what if there's a Taiwan contingency and North Korea tries to take advantage of it, right? So it's not, they have to think of um, the possibility of both of them having a taking place at the same time. So that's that's kind of the source of the concern I think our OK has. And I think um I think because of that we all have to you know talk to each other and try to figure out you know what our concerns are and how we collectively deal with in terms of Japan's um interactions with Taipei, well um Japan has a, a a purposefully ambiguous policy um, toward um, Taiwan, and I think uh, regarding Taiwan and um, Japan's policy, as you know, has been officially uh, official policy has been that it um, understands and respects um, China's um, PRC's claim, um, but obviously it has maintained very uh, vibrant unofficial relations with. with Taiwan. There are a lot of legal constraints when it comes to certain relationships, and I think Japan will also have to think of you know whether it makes sense um, to do that. Would, would it like there will there be more harm <laughs> in certain steps than um, more you know cons and pros I guess um, than the upsides of certain actions. So those are some of the um, decisions that um, Japan has to make. That's a that's a very good that's a very good, good example of um situation. Okay. Um, thank you, Doctor. Um, I think I'll, I'll go to uh, another online question, then one uh, from our from our audience. Um, we've received a question uh, from uh, Germantes Leilari, a an author who's written for us uh, before with uh, for uh, the GTB um, publication, so we know well, and he's currently a uh, visiting scholar at the National uh, Juncture University in uh, in Taiwan. And he's asked the question, uh, given that the US military is now beginning to openly train and exercise in Taiwan, or at least certainly have a more uh, open um, uh, uh, mill to mill relationship with Taiwan. He asked, uh, can the speakers discuss how would the ROC, that's Republic of China, Taiwan, how would the ROC military be able to train and exercise with the militaries of the region, such as Japan, South Korea, Philippines? Australia and others. And I actually might take that and maybe expand it a little bit beyond just the uh, a very narrow mill to mill discussion, but uh, to present the question. So what would be the, the practical impediments or difficulties, legal or otherwise, for uh, some other countries uh, in the region to sort of build upon or to have a more uh, robust uh, security relationship uh, with Taiwan? Uh, would any of you have, uh, have any thoughts on that question? Of course, obviously, it's China. China will always be watching us. You know, China would immediately uh, file a diplomatic protest here in Manila. You have to adopt, you know, remember, uh, always remind us of this one China policy that Taiwan is only a province of China. So that's, you know, a practical uh, obstacle we have to take into account. My suggestion is if there will be, of course, a joint military exercise between these concerned countries, it could adopt the model of the RIMPAC. Everyone is familiar with RIMPAC, and it should be held outside of the region, away, of course, from the privy eye of, you know, mainland China, probably somewhere in the United States. That's the ideal, uh, ideal place. But, of course, this would entail a lot of resources. But, of course, again, you have to take into account China would always be watching our actions here especially in this part of the world. All right, Dr. Castro, thank you. So, Joseph? Yeah, I would suggest uh, that uh, training at uh, neutral sites uh, where the United States could invite allies uh, to, to visit and, and, and train in Guam, suggest that we're, we're not going to recreate the International Military Training Center anywhere west of uh, California, but with with liberal application of the Arctic simulation, we uh, we can do an awful lot of training that is discreet as far as any uh, outside observers goes, but uh, uh, but be able to increase contact to 
built with, with force development, operational concept development, and all these things. Uh, might also add uh, something else that hasn't been mentioned yet about Japan's overall contribution to security in the region. Japan is the most trusted nation in ASEAN by, by polling figures, and uh, we're finding Japan's coattails on this uh, for obvious reasons. But a lot of uh, a lot of Japanese investment can go to ASEAN nations that it's then turned around and used to purchase defense articles from Japan which Japan is now, by their new interpretations, allowed to export. Uh, the Philippines is recently a beneficiary of this. Uh, this also affects what I was trying to lead to with the problems of all the island nations across the Pacific that have the opportunity to either aid or obstruct our logistics pipeline in an emergency. And uh, Japanese investment by these small island nations, along with U.S. investment, I would submit is a relatively small payment for major, major benefits that uh, will be necessary, might be necessary in the future. I think so. Uh, going back to our answer, I believe we had a hand up over here, sir, if we could uh, get the microphone to this channel. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ken Scanlon from Marine Corporation. So uh, I just want to raise uh, a little bit of the discussion. So do you think, would you say we are all Already, uh, the trajectory toward World War Three because today's uh, uh, presentation sounds me uh, both uh, a lot. Uh, North Korea, uh, and uh, is uh, so you uh, for us. So it reminds me some, uh, you know, now it's uh, only one year after the uh, Ukraine invasion. So do you think we are already this trajectory? And if you do, uh, is there any lesson from the World War II to prevent the World War Three? Okay. Uh... At the uh, risk of jumping on the, the panel's toes, I'll offer my own very brief response to that in terms of whether or not we're headed for World War III. Uh, I certainly hope not. Um, and I might have to start uh, piling canned food. Uh, but but uh, for more seriously, I'll look to our, uh, I guess, uh, uh, drawing of that, I, I'm pretty interested in the question as to, uh, you know, from uh, your question, sir, and from some of the comments that were made uh, by the panels. As to whether or not we are indeed seeing the emergence of a rival alliance system uh, in uh, in the the Indo Pacific or the Asia Pacific uh, region, uh, and if so, you know what what's the proper policy response to that? Um, any thoughts from any of our, our panelists uh, in regards to that? I'll jump on that one. The the. And there are lessons from history that, that need to be learned here, and, and you hit on it. Uh, one of the things that uh, that is different, in my opinion, from the onset of World War II is the strong throwing of NATO on behalf of Ukraine. Yeah, we could have done better by getting Ukraine more stuff quicker, uh, but this is a much, much uh, more robust response to um, an attack. Then uh, NATO's even expanding fits and starts here with Sweden and Finland, thanks to Turkey. But uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it's a much different posture, and European nations have increased their defense budgets and things and as a result of this. If, you know, Russia has, if nothing else, uh, uh, focus on some, some thinking. Uh, Dr. Aoki is more qualified to talk on this than I am, but from a layman's point of view, uh, the um, the evolution, the revolution, whatever we wish to call it, within Japan, starting with the Prime Minister Abe's second term and all the things that, that went on there, uh, now being carried on by uh, Prime Minister Kishida, uh, is a great enhancement to our deterrence. And we've got to get the deterrence in place to make sure that 
uh, at the bottom line, when no policy fails and everything, that no that North Korea, China, Russia uh, cannot make any logical decisions that today is today. Um, we're complicated by the need for uh, um, land defense in Japan and the Philippines and other places, but thinking of Korea's attempts to coerce Japan like they tried to coerce South Korea to threats to uh, with weapons of mass destruction, uh, direct weapons, but with increasing the ability to do integrated air events that's along with that. Uh, uh, there's an organization in the United States called Freedom House, it's sort of government sponsored and non governmental organizations that they're sort of with. Freedom is expanding across the globe or declining. Uh, recently, the reports are all very depressing. It's going the other way. Um, so, beyond just the very smart departments created by Japan recently, and the Philippines soft power is absolutely necessary to make sure that we support right thinking governments and we support those places that are they're all important but those places that would be critical to us if we uh, had to reinforce our, our capabilities um, I, 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 I i think your question is apt we need to uh, pay attention to this uh, we mentioned north korea more than a few times here but uh, north korea's ability to continue to flout international conventions Particularly, the threat that they put, uh, that they present to Japan and South Korea is uh, uh, something that's got to be managed, uh, and it's all key to to this uh, to determine across the Pacific. It's not just one nation anymore; it's three of them, and we need to continue to develop like uh, like we're doing. Yeah, yes, okay. I'd like to add a little bit um, in terms of uh, World War Three. Well, I. As I, as um, Mr. Dawson mentioned, I, I hope not. And I hope that doesn't happen. We're all working to make sure or try to make sure that doesn't happen. And the good news is nobody wants that. Um, does that. And the way I know I talked about the cooperation or increasing cooperation between and among China, uh, Russia, and North Korea in the wake of the war in Ukraine. Um, but I, I would not call that an alliance. Although China and North Korea are actually technically treaty allies, they renewed their treaty in 2021. So um, they're technically treaty allies, but it's not that they, they cooperate when they want to, but they're not the best of friends. China, as you, uh, and I think China's support for Russia for the war in Ukraine, that's enthusiastic. So um, they're not exactly the best of friends. And also, I would also note that the um, the United States and its allies and partners know what they want in terms of you know trying to protect the rules based order. Whereas the China, North Korea, and Russia, it, it's unclear what they are for. We know, we know what they're against what <laughs> but we don't really know what they're for and um so um i would include those elements in in what your your um what you say your question yeah, I uh, we missed we the united states missed an opportunity uh, uh earlier and we did a very bad we, we did a great disservice to the philippines uh, the, the, when china started its uh, illegal land grab in the south china sea and think of it they they dredged up enough coral and ocean bottom to create three thousand or more new acres of what turned out to be airfields and deep water ports uh, people that uh, study marine science small and marine science uh, maintained it the depth See, with a disastrous follow on effect for prosperity in Asia and its on, on products. The Philippines brought uh, alone brought a challenge to the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague. The United States remained silent, in my opinion, shamefully. 
in the court the, the court of appeals, uh, the uh, court decision came down in favor of the Philippine case. The United States again remained silent. Uh, President Obama had a conversation with Xi Jinping at the Sunnyland Summit in California, and Xi Jinping, to uh, President Obama's face, told him he would not militarize those features in the South China Sea. Bang! By the weekend, we got runways and airports and, uh, and SAM installations. Uh, it's uh, that is a parallel, I think, maybe to uh, to the Europe uh, of World War II. It's not an exact parallel, but it's a rough one. That, that's when. We don't stand up for things that we believe in, the free and open international, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific, thank you, Prime Minister Abe, for that term, uh, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the liberal international order that we believe in, uh, then bad things happen. We need to, it's not just military power, it's diplomacy, it's everything else, but we need to resist uh, attacks on these things. All right, thanks, sir. I think we might perhaps have time for one more question. I know, sir, you had your, your hand up a little bit. If you get a microphone to this gentleman, then please identify yourself and uh, give us a question. Um, not to be too depressing, but do you think the attendance of mutually assured destruction still apply when one person irrationally can make all of the military advances and all the supply chain? improvements and all of that and, and throwing into that picture the, the idea espoused here by other by speakers that the real issue is what we do terrestrially but we have to arm space thank you um uh, perhaps dr i don't know much of your uh, work sure. um, so, yeah so i think um and I'm going to take your question of mutually assured destruction in the nuclear policy sense. And in terms of nuclear um, policy, nuclear security policy, the challenge today is it's no longer just on a mutually assured destruction kind of work when it was the United States and the Soviet Union. Now the United States has to worry about um, the Russia and China, which is increasing its um, basically. Uh, Conducting a rapid military modernization, nuclear modernization as well. So, what the United States has to worry is, you know, what if the two countries work together? Right? Then that change, changes the equation. So, I think that's a complicated factor. That's a complicating factor that is going to change the way we think about that particular aspect of nuclear. Um, uh, mutually assured destruction. But I think you're. Uh, question may have been in a wider sense because you mentioned did you mention chips and like uh, semiconductors or what, did you mean that? Uh, so we're talking about there's a every year we're behind in this category of weapons, this carry category of weapons. They're all conventional weapons. Oh, okay. <laughs> and at some point, somebody says, "I'm not going to lose. I don't care how many. We're not going to take these losses." If, if the Ukraine was nuclear armed, would they have tolerated the attacks that, that they've sustained? Yeah. We, we, pres we presume that we have a solution and we have no choice but to think conventional and respond. And, and you say no appeasement, but at some point, the loser isn't going to accept a loss. Uh, yes, thank you. So I, I will just um, note that deterrence is, oh, it's not just about um, like increasing your defense capabilities. Um, it's also so about assurance in the sense that the adversary has to know that nothing terrible will happen to, to the adversary if it refrains from certain actions. And that requires signaling, messaging, and policy as well. So it has to be an overall policy that includes including uh, that includes um, basically building up your defense capabilities, but also diplomacy and, you know, talking to the other side. Of the All right. uh, thank you. Dr. <laughs> um, I think we, uh, we're coming up uh, to the end of our time, as is uh, always, unfortunately, the case uh, with these seminars. We uh, you, you have more topic than you do time. Uh, and I think we have come to the, the end of our allotted uh, scheduled time. I'd like to ask all of you to uh, join me in a, a brief round of applause for all of our panelists. Uh, 
Uh, it strikes me, uh, Dr. DeCastro, uh, I want to give a special note of thanks to you, sir, for joining us at such a, an uncivilized hour of uh, Manila time. But thank you for joining us and uh, sharing your uh, your insights with us. And uh, I, I don't want to prevent you any further from being able to get to bed. But thank you very much. Hopefully, I'll be there by uh, summer because I'll be spending three months in Washington, D.C. as a fellow in the East West Center. Excellent. We'll look forward to seeing you. Well, to you, sir, uh, to Dr. Aoki, General Gregson, thank you very much for sharing your insights with us today. And once again, thank you to uh, all of you who have joined in our audience, either in person or, or online. And please keep an eye out for future.